Who was Jesus? He had compassion for the weak and the hurting. He loved every person he met and taught them how to love. His great heart helped all those who came near him. But most of all, he was a friend. That was who he was. Now find out who he is. Hello and welcome to 3ABN's 2021 Virtual Summer Camp Meeting, where we're answering the question, who is Jesus? All of the messages that you will hear throughout this camp meeting will address that very question. Please make sure that you visit 3abncampmeeting.org so you can stay apprised as to what will be taking place. We don't want you to miss any of these power-packed presentations or any of these inspiring songs. Each night at 9 p.m. Central, we'll have a Q&A segment that will only be available on the 3ABN Plus platform. So please visit 3abnplus.tv to take part in that. Make sure that you text your questions to 618-228-3975. Our speaker today is Christopher Hudson. He's known as the forerunner of the Forerunner Chronicles, a powerful, powerful media ministry and a great evangelist for the gospel of Christ. I'm honored to call him my friend. Chris is originally from New York, is a proud husband and father to Denise and Heaven, respectively. After we are blessed by a musical selection from Celestine Dickens, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Christopher Hudson. God bless you. Hear ye him. It's not what I prayed for, it's not what I wanted, it's not something I understand. My circumstances seem so confusing, I'm placing it all in your hands. Your ways are higher than mine. I want mountains to move, you want me to climb, so I'm gonna trust your word, your will and your time. Your ways are higher than mine. One day I'm sure I will look back and marvel at how you knew best all along. You see from heaven, you know it's the hard times that make my face steady and strong. Your ways are higher than mine. I want mountains to move, you want me to climb, so I'm gonna trust your word, your will, and your time. Your ways are higher than mine. When I start to doubt, help me believe somewhere. So far above me, be. your ways are higher than mine. I want mountains to move, you want me to climb. So I'm gonna trust your work, your will, and your time. So much higher than mine. Your ways are higher than mine. 
What a blessing and a privilege it is for me to be here with you to share at this year's 2021 virtual summer camp meeting that 3ABN is hosting. I really appreciate the words of that song because the ways of God are truly higher than ours. Before I get into my subject matter at this time, which is the righteous redeemer, and clearly the foregone conclusion is that that righteous redeemer is none other than Jesus Christ himself, I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. And as it is my tradition, I'm going to kneel to pray at this time. And if you feel inclined to do so, you can kneel with me at home as we approach the throne of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, great God of the universe, I thank you for the awesome privilege that you've extended to all of us, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and grace to aid us in our times of need. And Lord, we need you. Even if we don't realize we need you, Father in heaven, we need you. And as you know, I love to claim your promise in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. You said, call upon me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And so as I prayed in times past, I pray once again. Lord, teach me the things that I do not understand. Use me to accomplish your divine purpose. Cleanse me of all sin, self-trust, and self-righteousness. I want to be a pure and useful conduit through which you might pour out your grace upon your people. So may the Holy Spirit be our teacher. For this thing we pray in the worthy and precious name of Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles if you have one, and I do hope that you have one. We're going to go to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, and we're going to begin at the verse, uh, Psalm chapter 45, Psalm the 45th division, and we're going to begin at verse 6. And though you know that we're going to be dealing with the subject of Jesus being the righteous redeemer, I want to approach this subject from a bit of a different perspective, and so I'm hoping that you'll follow along. And I'm going to repeat some things over and over again. I really do believe that repetition deepens impression, and so I'm going to use that, and hopefully you'll be benefited by that. In the book of Psalms, chapter 45 and verse 6, the Bible says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now, a throne is used in the Bible as a symbol of a kingdom or an established government. And in this case, we know we're talking about a divine kingdom or divine government because this is the throne of God that's being spoken of. And in the Bible addressing the nature or the enduring nature, I should say, of the throne of God, the scripture says the throne of God is forever. Not just forever, but forever and ever, which means that the kingdom of God is eternal and it will never see any end. But the very basis, the very reason for which the throne of God will stand forever and the kingdom of God will never see an end is because the scepter of his kingdom is a right scepter. This is the very reason that God's throne, his kingdom, will endure forever. And because we have another symbol, we need to address the issue. So a scepter can be used as a symbol. Matter of fact, a scepter really is just that instrument, that instrument of authority that is wielded by a potentate such as a king as he carries out his administrative responsibilities. And the Bible lets us know that God, as he carries out his administrative responsibilities as the king of kings and lord of lords, he employs principles that are altogether right to govern his vast kingdom. That word right in the original language from whence it was translated, it means that these principles are principles of equity, meaning that they are not biased in the least bit. There's no double standard. Everything is fair. Matter of fact, that word right also means just. So when it comes to the principles that God uses to carry out the administrative functions of his government, there is absolutely, positively no partisanship. What is good for one is good for the other. What is good for the rich is good for the poor. What is good for the weak, it's good for the strong. What is good for the intelligent is also good for the not so educated. It makes no difference. Everything is clear, straight, and comprehensible for all. And the law, the principles by which God carries out the administration of his government are binding upon all. 
And this is the reason why his throne will stand forever. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Matter of fact, again, Hebrews chapter 1 is a, a favorite chapter of mine because Paul takes the time in that chapter to contrast the distinct difference between the authority and the nature of Christ with the authority and the nature of angels. And as he does so, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, matter of fact, the Apostle Paul is actually quoting the psalmist, the very psalm that I just shared with you a moment ago, but he uses a different word. He tells us there, thy throne, O God, but unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Once again, my friends, the Bible lets us know that God utilizes righteousness as he carries out the affairs of his government. Right doing is the very premise of every judgment that is made by God, and that's important because it is only as God employs righteous principles to conduct the affairs of his government that every one of his rulings can be deemed to be just, fair, not partisan. And I hope you've realized that that which is just is also righteous. And that which is righteous is also just. These things are synonymous. A just man is a righteous man. A righteous man is a just man. And the standard by which one is defined to be righteous or just are the very principles by which God utilizes or employs to carry out the functions of his government. The question is, what is an appropriate definition for righteousness? We know that righteousness can mean right doing in its broadest sense. But I come to understand that we're living in a time where people like to relegate terms such as righteousness to the bin of relativity. You know, everything is relative. What you think is right, what I think is right. And if you have your standard of right and I have my standard of right and they have their standard of right, we're all going to be in a big mess. There needs to be one uniform standard by which we can define what righteousness, what right doing is, and God has given us one. In the book of Psalm chapter 119 and verse 172, the Bible says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. God's commandments are his universal standard of right doing. They are the legal parameters that God himself has erected to preserve the very prosperity, to ensure the very joy and happiness of all the beings that exist within his vast dominion. God's commandments are his, are his universal constitution for all of creation. And these are the very principles that are continuously utilized in all of God's judgments for his kingdom that ensures that the kingdom of God will stand forever. Ladies and gentlemen, that's so important for us to understand. In the book of Psalms, chapter 97 and verse 2, it actually speaks of this issue once again. A little bit different language, brings in a bit of a different concept, but it brings the same message home to our minds. In Psalm 97 and verse 2, the scriptures tell us clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Now, the word habitation means foundation, letting us know that at the very foundation of the throne of God, we can find both righteousness as well as judgment. And the fact of the matter is that all of the judgments of God are carried out based on the righteous principles that are contained codified, if you will, in his Ten Commandments. At the foundation of the throne of God, what do we have? Righteousness. But what is the very definition of righteousness according to the word of God? His commandments. And the very function of a foundation is to sustain something that is set up or erected on top of it. The very function of a foundation 
is to ensure the permanence of something that might be erected on that foundation or set on top of that foundation, letting us know that as long as God's commandments stand sure, and as long as all of the judgments of God are promoted or declared, as long as all of God's rulings are done in direct compliance with his holy royal law. The throne will stand forever. The throne will stand forever. And I need to really emphasize that last point. Maybe I didn't make it clear enough, and so I'm going to try to do it right now. It's not good enough for the commandments to be at the very foundation of the throne of God. But all of God's commandments must be utilized as he makes his judgments. There cannot be a different interpretation of the commandments for one class or another class, for one group or another group. There must be one universal interpretation of the commandments by which all of God's judgments are declared. So friends, if you attack the commandments, you attack the throne. If you attack God's righteous judgments, you attack the throne. All must stand for the throne to stand and for the kingdom to continue throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. And I'm God that I'm glad that God's judgments are righteous judgments. And there is great value in having a universal constitution that promotes righteous judgments for all. The Bible speaks of the great value that God himself places on the righteous judgments that go forth as they're based upon the unchanging nature of his commandments. In the book Psalm chapter 19 and verse 9, and it might be a familiar verse of scripture to many of us, the scripture tells us there, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The commandments, rather the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Then it goes on to tell us in verse 15, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. My friends, God's righteous judgments are so precious. They're so valuable that they are of greater worth than fine gold. That means all the wealth that one can amass could never equal the magnitude of the value that God has placed on his ability to continually promote righteous judgments for all of his vast kingdom. And it also lets us know that if God's law is transgressed by anyone, then the righteous judgments must be the same for everyone. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans 6 and verse 23, familiar scripture, the wages of sin is death. That's it. If one transgresses the law of God, that judgment that comes down from the throne of God, the same for angel as it is for man, the wages, the payment, the requirement of the law is death of the transgressor. But I praise the Lord that the rest of the scripture says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It may seem like a very harsh judgment that the wages of sin must be death. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it is the only way for God to secure the integrity of his government so that all created beings can enjoy peace, prosperity, and true happiness throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Now, there is a dilemma and the dilemma is this. The, scripture are, the scriptures are clear in the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which means that 
by requirement of law, all are worthy of death. And as I stated earlier, God's law is so precious, it's so valuable, more than fine gold, that there is absolutely, positively, no gift that man in and of himself can offer to satisfy the requirements of the law. Even the scriptures tell us in the book of Psalms, chapter 49, Psalm the 49th chapter, I believe it is. Psalm the 49th chapter. And I'm going to look now at the sixth verse. The scriptures tell us here, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give, our, nor give to God a ransom for him. And then I love the next part of that verse because it goes on to say, for the redemption of their soul is precious. You could work for 10 lifetimes over and you still would not be able to amass a sufficient amount of wealth that would satisfy the price that is necessary to ransom a soul. Because the Bible tells us that the redemption of the soul is precious. And because the redemption of the soul is so precious to God, only something equally as precious will suffice to satisfy the price of the ransom. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, the word of God tells us, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received as tradition from your fathers. It's very clear. No silver, no gold, no human resources. The might of man, all of our works combined, insufficient to equal the precious nature of a soul, cannot redeem us. And it's very interesting because the Bible says these things are all corruptible things. How could we even think that the works of a corruptible man or silver and gold, which in and of themselves are corruptible, could ever satisfy the requirements of an eternal law? Only an offering that is eternal could satisfy the requirements of a law that is eternal. Only that would be precious enough. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, what is precious enough? Because although we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain conversation received by tradition from our fathers, the Bible goes on to say, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish, and without spot. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross that sufficed to pay the price to ransom you and I. Nothing else would suffice. An eternal sacrifice would have to be offered to meet the demands of a ransom that is demanded by an eternal law. And what I love about this so much is that the word of God says when Jesus gave his precious, his precious blood, he did so as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, a life that was pure, a life that was holy, a life that lived in total harmony with God's righteous and holy law. He lived a life that the law of God, the commandments of God would truly declare to be just. And when was this ransom offered for us? The scriptures tell us in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 8. It says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before there was a blade of grass, 
before God said, let there be light, before there were any luminary bodies, before there was the dust of the ground that God utilized to fashion and form into a man, before he breathed into his nostrils to make that man into a living soul, the Bible lets us know that God provided a redeemer for us to pay for it, a ransom for us. God's foreknowledge in his omniscience, knowing that we would need divine assistance, have mercy, knowing that we would need divine assistance even before he brought us into existence. He provided a redeemer for us. It's something that every time I think about it, it really just gets to my heart. It just seems totally unfathomable how God would provide for us a redeemer before he even brought us into existence. What wondrous love is this, that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And friends, in God paying forward the price for our ransom, his desire is for all of us to be saved in his kingdom. He has made Jesus Christ everything for us so that none of us have to be lost. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 that God has made Christ unto us both wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus truly is our righteous redeemer, everything that we need. Somebody says, but listen. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Doesn't the Bible say that in the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 12, or Romans chapter 7, rather, and verse 12? Yes, the answer is yes. The Bible clearly states that we are carnal, and the law is spiritual. But the Bible also goes on to tell us in the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus has made provision. He's made a way we have a righteous redeemer. And I need to touch on that point because I find it once again so heartwarming and touching. And I don't even think, I really don't even think those words are adequate. Because the very fact that Jesus Christ would be willing to take upon himself humanity for the purpose of redeeming us truly lets us know that he was meeting the requirements of the law to function as our redeemer. Because a redeemer has to be one that is near of kin, has to be a close family member. Jesus said, the only way that I can redeem them is if I can come as close as possible to them. Now, that might not mean much to you at this time because you've heard many times. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this thing might be something that you've become so familiar with that you're not even taking the time to truly consider it. But for Jesus to truly humble himself, come down from the throne of the universe, the eternal throne, to humble himself to become like one of us? You know what the Bible has to say about us? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 41 and verse 14, God speaking to his very people, his chosen people, he says to them, fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. Before I go any further, God calls his people worms. Somebody says, oh no, he just called Jacob worm. Well, remember, Jacob wrestled with the angel and he became Israel. Jacob and all of his children, worms. And God says to his people, fear not, thou worm Jacob. Despicable, reprehensible, undesirable, weak, As you may be, fear not, God says, I will help you. I will help you, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the God of Israel. Can you imagine? So that means for Jesus to become our next of kin, 
If we're worms, he has to become a worm just like us. <laughs> well, look, look what the Bible says. If you go with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, the second chapter, Hebrews chapter two. In Hebrews, the second chapter, once again, I really do encourage you, when you have the time, just study the book of Hebrews. It speaks in such marvelous language concerning the humility that was exercised by Jesus for the purpose of our salvation. And in Hebrews chapter 2, which speaks of the nature of Christ, the Bible tells us in verse 16, for verily, for verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For Jesus to take on him the seed of Abraham, my friends, that means he became worms like us. Because Isaac is the seed of Abraham. And Jacob was the seed of Isaac. And Israel, well, that's Isaac. Excuse me, that's Jacob, rather. What's the point? Jesus says, they're worms, I'll become worms just like them for the purpose of saving them. That's exactly what the prophet and the King David said in the book of Psalms chapter 22. In Psalm the 22, Psalm the 22nd division rather, Psalm chapter 22, looking at verse six, the Bible says that Jesus said, I said Jesus said yes, because though this may be David speaking, these are the words of Jesus. He said, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that look upon me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in God, let him deliver him. Because he delighted in him. Clearly a messianic prophecy dealing with the last moments of the life of Jesus Christ because if you turn your Bibles with me, Friends, brothers, and sisters, to the book of Matthew, chapter 29, chapter 27, rather. I want you to begin at verse 39. The Bible tells us, as Jesus hung between heaven and earth, the people passed by him, reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it again in three days, Save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also, the chief priests mocking him with the elders and the scribes, they all said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If thou truly be the king of Israel, come down now from the cross and we'll believe you. My friends, these are the words that we saw just a few moments ago in the book of Psalms, chapter 22, where Jesus said, I am a worm. He became a worm so that he could deliver us worms. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross for us. He did all of this that he might provide the ransom that was necessary to restore us. But the work of redemption isn't over. Somebody says the work of redemption was completed at the cross. Yes, the ransom was paid at the cross. Our redemption was secured at the cross. Uh, but the work of redemption is not over. How do we know this? Well, if you go with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matter of fact, before we go to Matthew, go here. Go to the book of Luke. Go to Luke chapter 21. If you begin at verse 25, speaking of the events that will take place, foreshadowing the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 25, 
after the tribulation of those days that the sun shall be dark, excuse me, it says there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It's clear we're looking at the events that transpired just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the word of God says there will be some signs that we will see in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, but those very specific signs are not spoken of here in the book of Luke chapter 21. However, if you now go over to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and begin with me at verse 29, some of these signs are actually spoken of where the scripture goes on to tell us after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then the scripture goes on to say, then shall appear the sun, then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So in Matthew chapter 24, now we know exactly what signs will take place in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. The sun will become darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven. The same thing is spoken of in specific detail in the book of Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 24, on the way to verse 25. However, the book of John, the gospel of John is the only gospel in which you do not find these signs spoken of that foreshadow the event of the second coming of Jesus Christ. However, John does speak of these things and he does so in the book of Revelation. If you go to the book of Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, where, you, where the, the opening of the seals are spoken of. And in Revelation chapter 6, starting with me now at verse 12, the Bible tells us there, And I beheld when the sixth seal was opened, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Same signs that we saw in the book of Matthew chapter 24, verses 29, and 30, same signs that you'll see in the book of Mark, chapter 13 as well, with the addition of this great earthquake. My friends, if you did not know already, all of these event, events have already taken place. For instance, that great earthquake that happened during the opening of the seal, that was the great earthquake of Lisbon that transpired in the year 1755. The sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon becoming like blood. That was the great dark day that took place in the year 1780. And the stars of heaven falling unto the earth, that amazing spectacle transpired in the year 1833. And so we have this timeline that is marked by these events that take us from 1755 all the way to 1833. If you open your Bible back up with me to the book of Luke, chapter 21, the Bible lets us know that after the issue of the sun, of the stars rather, falling to the earth, an event that would take place in the year 1833, things would start happening on planet earth. There would be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And then men's hearts would begin to fail them for fear for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. I believe with all of my heart that the things that are taking place right now in our world are significant prophetic events that are helping to agitate this prophetic event, this prophetic situation. Bringing about the distress of the nations with perplexity, all the nations being distressed. Have we ever seen things like what we're seeing right now? The nations being distressed simultaneously and the great thinking minds and even the scientists perplexed as to what they are to do. How do we combat climate change? How do we combat this crisis? How do we do with, deal with the economic crises that are right now upon us? You know, there's one thing that I've come to realize. 
If you print trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars out of thin air and keep stimulating and stimulating and stimulating, I don't care if you're overstimulating something biological, something technical, or something governmental. You're on a downward spiral to a breakdown. And because, all of, because of all of this distress and the perplexing nature of the things that are transpiring, the Bible says that thinking men, their hearts are failing them for fear because they realize something is coming and they really don't have the solution. But I praise the Lord that at the very time men's hearts are failing them for fear, the Bible tells us that something is on the horizon. It's the second coming of Jesus. And the Bible goes on to say in Luke chapter, one, chapter 21 and verse 28, and when all these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. My friends, the final act of the work of redemption is right before us in the immediate future. Because the work of redemption will never be complete in the mind of God until you and I have been perfectly restored back into his image, back into his likeness, standing on the sea of glass physically in his immediate presence. And that is an event that is very soon to take place which is extremely beautiful to me when I consider this because Jesus secured our redemption in eternity past and Jesus will complete our redemption in the future that's immediately before us. Which lets me know from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of, Re book of Revelation, the entirety of the Bible is nothing more than, than an immense unfolding of the awesome plan of redemption. And the central figure of this history is the righteous redeemer, Jesus Christ himself. Every chapter, every book of the Bible, it speaks to us concerning the work of the righteous redeemer. And if we fail to see the righteous redeemer in any of our study of the Bible, then my friends, we study the Bible altogether wrong. We need to be looking forward to the culmination of the work of redemption. This is where our attention needs to be riveted. This is where our minds need to be focused. This is where all creation is focused. The word of God tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans the 8th chapter. In Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 22, the Bible says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, until now. And not only they, but we also, we also, which have received the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. All of creation is waiting for the final work of the plan of redemption to be accomplished, and that is when we, by the grace of God, stand in his righteousness before his glorious presence. But the word of God says, if you are looking for the appearing of the righteous redeemer, if you are awaiting for this great climactic event, the blessed hope of the return of Jesus Christ, the righteous, and you're doing so without the first fruits of the Spirit operating in you, then the reality is your waiting is in vain. My friends, we need to have the first fruits of the Spirit operating in us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, and verse 14, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Only as we allow the presence of God's Spirit to reign within our lives so that the beauty of holiness can be revealed through us, are we truly preparing for the time of redemption. God is looking to see 
if there are people today that are revealing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. He's looking for this harvest in our lives. Is the Spirit operating in you? Is that fruit being revealed in your home? Is it being revealed in the workplace? Is it being revealed in your marriage? Because Jesus didn't just come to pay the ransom that the law demanded so that we could be restored. Jesus came to empower us so that we could live a life of holiness. How are you waiting for the righteous redeemer? You know, the other day I was out with my daughter, Heaven. I don't remember what I was doing, but I know I was busy. And getting busy, Heaven got hungry. So I knew I needed to get something for Heaven to eat. And so I went to a nearby eatery and I started having them make this bowl for her. A little bit of brown rice here, some guacamole, some beans, all these things. And as I'm, as I'm having them put this bowl together for her, the cashier yelled down the line to me and asked me, is that all that you're getting? And I responded to him, yes. But I found it quite curious that he asked me this question because it's usually something that they would ask once you actually arrived at the cash register. But here I was a good deal of a distance from completing my order, and he was already asking me if this was all that I was planning on getting. And by the time I reached to the register, the cashier said to me, don't worry, you don't have to pay, it's all taken care of. And I said, what were you talking about? He said, there was a gentleman that was in here before you and he paid it forward for you. And it caught me off guard and I immediately, I ran out of this eatery to find the gentleman and I did find the gentleman. And I wanted to thank him and I did thank him for the kindness that he showed me because he had no real reason to do it. I did nothing to merit the kindness that he showed to me. But it's still, but still, he paid it forward for me. And so I wanted to extend to him my gratitude. And I wanted to give him something, and I gave him something. You know, brothers and sisters, before we even arrived on the scene, Jesus paid our ransom forward. We've done nothing to merit this kindness. He's done it solely out of the vast love that resides within his heart. And although many of us may have grown up in atmospheres where we were not knowledgeable of this love, of this immense kindness that God has shown towards us, once the knowledge of the truth has come to us, the very least that we can do, is tell the Lord how much we appreciate what he's done for us. And not just tell him, not just tell God how thankful we are for the kindness that he has shown to us in paying the ransom that the Lord demanded for us. But we should give him something. And all that we can truly give him is our hearts. I mean all of our hearts all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, we need to give him everything. Are you willing to give him everything? I pray that when the righteous redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, returns to this earth for the called and the chosen and the faithful, he will find you living a life of gratitude 
that is revealed by continual loving obedience to his commandments. My friends, it makes no difference where you find yourself right now in this life. Jesus can redeem you. I know what I'm talking about. A few years ago, before the Lord called me out into full-time ministry, I was in the music industry. I was writing films for motion pictures. And I was caught up in a lifestyle that was altogether reprehensible. Matter of fact, I was trying to live the life that harmonized with what seemed to be popular within the culture when I was a young man. I'm still a young man. And I'll never forget, I, was, I got caught up in selling quite a, deal, quite a great deal of narcotics. I was moving drugs from New York to the South, and the operation was going so well that I had to pick up new product on a weekly basis. And I'll never forget, there was one weekend as I came back to New York, picking up some more drugs to take back down South to continue making money hand over fist. I told some of my friends at that time, I said, you know what? I'm so tired of having to make this trip. I wish that I could just hold off making this trip for at least one more week. And then a friend told me that they were at a nightclub the, a nightclub the previous week and that I would be able to go into that club that very night and be able to move a great deal of weight. That's the language that we use for saying we'd be able to move a lot of product. And I went there on the strength of his word because you know all of us sometimes we have that friend whose word we tend to trust a little bit more than the others. Well, that was that guy. And on the strength of his word, I went and did something that I traditionally would not do, but it was just as he said. And I was making money hand over fist that night. And of a certainty, I was not going to have to make the journey for another week. But as, as I was in the midst of all of the folly, the drinking and the revelry all, revelry, all of a sudden, the police came into the club. Two, three o'clock in the morning, the police came into the club and they said, everybody get up against the wall. And as I got up against the wall, one of my friends looked at me and he had these eyes on. Basically, the eyes were saying to me, wow, you're done. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? This is life that I chose. And sometimes it goes this way. But I did have parents that taught me to pray. And so I said my prayer in that hour. I said, Lord, you don't have to get me out of this. But if you can get me out of this, get me out of this. That was my prayer. And I'll never forget as I was there with my hands up against the wall and the officers were checking each individual one by one, one by one. And as they checked an individual, they told them to sit down in the chair that was nearby them. As the police officer was nearing myself to begin his search on my person, another officer came from the total opposite direction in the club, engaged, in a, engaged him in a conversation that took him to the total opposite end of the club. And there I was looking at all of this taking place. And I saw this seat nearby between two large men, and because I'm not as large, as these NFL looking gentlemen, I thought if I could get into that chair, I'm good. And so I started doing my best rendition of Michael Jackson. I started just sliding on the floor. Bit by bit, I slid on the floor and I got over to that chair. I sat down in that chair and I leaned back in my seat and nobody <laughs> realized that they didn't check me. And I thought to myself, once again, I've gotten away. I'm too smart for them. Yeah, God had something for me still. The lead officer came into the club and he said, did you toss everyone? That was their language for, did you check everyone? They said, yes, we tossed everyone. He said, well, toss them all again. My heart fell into my foot. This time you had to go to the door that was the entrance into the club. There was only one way in, one way out. I knew there was no way for me to get away. So when it, was, when it was my time to get checked, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna take it like a man. I walked up to the gentleman. I walked up to the police officer and I threw my hands up behind my head. And I had on one of these winter parkers. 
And so he started his search on me, and this is what he did. He said, he said, go over there. He never checked <laughs> my bottom pockets that looked like they had teddy bears inside of them. I mean, literally, they were the biggest thing on me, and he never touched them. One of my friends looked at me. He looked at me like he saw a ghost. He said, there's no way. That's impossible. He said, man, man you must have prayed. And you know what? I did pray. And even in the midst of my folly, God came through for me. And you may be in the midst of some folly right now. You may be engaged in a lifestyle or in transactions or some type of intimate associations that you know you have no business being a part of. But Jesus is ready to redeem you. He prayed, he paid, he paid the price for your salvation. All you need to do is give your heart to him, trust him, and he will lift you up higher than the human thoughts, higher than the highest thought that you can ever have for yourself Jesus Christ will lift you up because his desire for you is to restore you back into his image and bring you right into his physical presence. May God bless you as you look unto Jesus. Amen. His body was broken so that we could live giving us the gift of eternal life. He pursues us relentlessly with an everlasting love, regardless of our failures and mistakes. The one who loves us like no other. This is who Jesus is.